We're missing the point as individuals. And if we do that corporately as a church. But spiritual pride can best be defined this way. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. When we begin to think that we are good enough on our own, that we don't need God to work in our lives, we're headed for a fall. I love the way the message translation, Eugene Peterson said it this way, and it's more abrupt, maybe more uh, poignant for us in our culture today. He writes this, First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. People with egos tend to uh, crash and burn. They end up on the bottom. And I think that's when we become independent as a church. We end up crashing. May we never forget how much we need Jesus Christ. Uh, Dwight M. Gunter wrote this. A church cannot accomplish anything good or lasting without God. One of the temptations, I think, for churches today, especially in Western civilization, is to come up with all these plans, all these schemes. You see something great another church is doing, and you want to copy it. But we are not dependent on God to make it happen. You know, oh, they're doing this kind of music? Let's copy that. Oh, this pastor does this charismatic, powerful thing? But they're not relying on God. Philadelphia, though, was a church that understood their absolute dependence on God. They knew their position. They knew that as a child of God, as a, a corporate group of children of God, they needed God to do the real work. It's not the plans, it's not the schemes, it's not the programs. It's Jesus, it's the Holy Spirit working through his church that makes the difference. And again, as individuals, this can be a problem for ourselves as individuals. And this is why I think Jesus taught that we need to be like children when it comes to our faith. In Matthew 18, 1 through 3, I believe this thing can work. There. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of God or heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This goes against everything inside of us. Doesn't it? And yet, in the economy of God, you are never greater than when you are a dependent child of His. When you can say, I'm a child of God, and I need God to work and move in my life, that's the best place to be. There's something profoundly beautiful and wonderful when we realize our identity as children of God. And so as a church, let us never forget about having this childlike faith in Him. The town of Philadelphia was a community built mostly upon agriculture. It was most likely the smallest town, and it was plagued with earthquakes and was literally destroyed in 17 AD. And it was scattered about with people living in the countryside, with a few living in the city proper, out of fear of another earthquake. As many of you also probably already know, the word Philadelphia means one who loves his brother, or the city of brotherly love. And if you know this about me, and the staff knows this about me, uh, very clearly, if a certain phrase is put together or a certain thought comes to my mind, it triggers me into a song. 
And as I'm studying this, this town of Philadelphia, all of a sudden I was triggered into a song, and I'm not going to sing it for you. Do I hear a praise the Lord? <laughs> but I was triggered into a song that made me think of Philadelphia. It's a song from an artist named Larry Norman. He is known as the grandfather of Christian rock. But he sang sing this song called Country Church. And it made me think of Philadelphia. It's, and I'm just going to share the choir or the chorus. It's this. Country church, country people, with their eyes upon the Lord, built a church with a steeple as a place to hear his word. You can live and die in the same small town, but the Lord spreads his love all around. And it made me go, wow, that's a church I kind of grew up in. It's kind of this church. It's Philadelphia. There's something fond in our heart when we see church as a special place where we can have this compelling Christian community where we care for one another. And it's really about Jesus. And it's really about his word. The Church of Philadelphia was this kind of place. It was an underdog kind of church. It was young, it was small, but God loved them. It had a few nice things to say about them in this letter. Verse 8, just a part of verse 8. I know your deeds, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Wouldn't that be a wonderful way to be known? You've kept my word and have not denied my name. Another way of putting it is, is they were faithful and they were obedient. In verse 10, it also says this, since you've kept my command to endure patiently. Faithful and obedient. They didn't boast about numbers. They didn't boast about budgets. They didn't boast about programs. But they were faithful and obedient. God's underdog, faithful and true. And it was what God was looking for in his church. And as a result of these things, of being faithful and true and obedient, God is giving them opportunities. Opportunities for expansion, maybe, but more importantly, for fruit. For fruit. And there's four things that we can garner from this passage. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. It's an opportunity. God is giving them an opportunity to do great things. Doesn't tell us what that opportunity is, except that it's an open door. God is giving us opportunities. Opportunities to love people into the kingdom of God. Right here in Dassel, Minnesota, we have opportunities, don't we? Just like Philadelphia. In verse 9, we see this. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. The proud will be humbled, and the humble will be lifted up. Those that are faithful and true and obedient to Jesus Christ, even though culturally it's not accepted, at some place and some time, the church that is faithful is lifted up and put on a pedestal. And we don't do that to be put on a pedestal. We do that to put Jesus Christ as the, as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on the proper throne. We exist so that people see Jesus through us. And then in 10b it says this, 
I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the world, whole world, to test the inhabitants of the earth. God promises this small, faithful, true, and obedient church that he will protect them, that he has their back, that if they will remain faithful and true, they don't have to worry. They will pass the test, the test that this world offers and gives them. God plus plus this small little church means they can't lose, that there's victory. And then verse 12, it says this, The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. It's interesting, this underdog church will be the pillar or one of the pillars in the kingdom of God, in the establishing of the forever eternal kingdom of God because they're faithful and true. Imagine that. This small little church that almost didn't survive because of earthquakes, but because they loved Jesus, didn't try to do things on their own, they remained, remained dependent on him, they will be in God's hall of fame. And every time you walk by into the, the temple of God, in the kingdom of God, there will be people that say, that's Philadelphia's pillar. That was the church that was faithful. And I don't know, you know, how many pillars there are going to be in the kingdom of God, but it sure would be nice to maybe even be a nail <laughs> in the synagogue, the kingdom of God, to say that's, that's Dassel Covenant Church. That nail represents them because they were faithful and true. Of course, I'm expounding on the text. But won't it be wonderful to be known as a church that was faithful and true? In 1879, in Dassel, Minnesota, a church was planted. It was this church. It was small when it started. It grew. But then it shrunk, which is often a pattern of pruning and maturing. Many great saints, some of which are your great-grandparents, have come and gone. Many have come to discover Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of their life here. Multiple generations have called this their church family. It has been the breeding ground of many pastors. Pastors have come and gone. Church buildings have been built. One of those church buildings was destroyed by a fire, but it rose from the ashes. Church additions took place, like where we're going to have coffee and treats after the service today. Now, I share this really quick, brief, and if, if uh, Bill Ward was here, and he'd want to give a lot longer <laughs> description of the history of the church. Because I think there's a reason that we're still here. We have remained dependent on Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we've been perfect. But we need to remain dependent on Jesus Christ. The problem, or rather danger, is to rest on history, tradition. Because that can actually become the idol that replaces Jesus Christ. It's far easy to coast from the past, the rich past that we've experienced. But like Philadelphia, God needs to be the one we hold on to. It can't even be the past. 
It's Jesus Christ. But they could have, we can, make the mistake of doing nothing. Becoming comfortable and complacent. Resting in a rich heritage of people that have gone before us. But we can't do that, can we? We need to remain strong. We need to remain faithful. You know, recently in Confirmation, we went through uh, the books of the Bible that a lot of times we skim over <laughs> or quickly gloss over. Uh, first and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. It's an interesting time in the history of the church, or of Israel, not the church, but of Israel. First, they start off by demanding that they want a king. They want a king like all the other nations, instead of letting God be the ruler and God leading them. And so God lets them have their own earthly king. And if you know the story, it seems like they get a lot of poor kings mixed in with a good king every once in a while. And during these patterns of up and down as a nation, it seems like again and again they reject, reject the one true God for a lot of small, small false gods. And amazing, though, is that God remains faithful. God is keeping his covenant with Israel again and again. And eventually he proves that he has kept that covenant by sending his son Jesus Christ, born in the stable, to remind them that God wants to be their leader, their king of kings and lord of lords. And eventually God will send Jesus to return, not in a stable, but as the conquering king that will establish the kingdom forever. But the reason I share with you that story is we can easily make the same mistakes that the nation of Israel does. We can bank it more on the things of this world than having a perspective on the eternal kingdom of God. And so I share that with you as a warning and an aspect of the danger that can come when we build it on our own independence and not dependence on God. And so if we look back, we look back at the earlier part, do we want God opportunities? Or do we want the small ones that this world offers but fails to really truly give? Do we want to be a church that God lifts up as an example? Or do we want to be one of the churches that God needs to correct and warn again and again? To repent? Do we want God's protection? Do we want to avoid the test? Or to win in the test? Or do we want to try in our own efforts to win against God's impending judgment? Do we want to be a pillar, an example of faithfulness and obedience of the kingdom of God, or do we want to simply survive? You see, there is a great difference between a church that is surviving and a church that is thriving in the mighty, powerful winds of the Holy Spirit working in our midst. And so, again, I remind us, including myself, that our mission is to lead people to a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. We cannot do this by our own human efforts. This is something that we need God to do in and through us. You see, God looks at a church and says, I don't need your abilities. I need your availabilities. And will you trust me? Will you trust me and be dependent upon me as a child and do something amazing through you? 
He did that for Philadelphia, and I believe he can do that for Dassel Covenant Church. We can be that dependent, childlike church that believes God can do great things. And may we do that humbly and as a child. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you, first of all, that uh, you love us. And you look at us not because we're strong, but because we're weak. You look at us not because we have it all together, but that you can use humble, childlike faith and do great things. Lord, we confess that uh, we don't have all of the things that uh, this world says you need to be great. But we are little children that once again turn to you and say, God, we believe you can do great things. So we trust you. We believe that you want to work through the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
In the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus Christ said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is a kingdom, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are blessed when we humble ourselves and know that we're not much without Jesus. Amen. Yes, Lord, yes.